Hey, you, you want to see something really scary? What's your favorite scary movie? I'm going to scare the hell out of you. What was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. They're coming to get you, Barbara. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. What's blood for, if not for shedding? Welcome to Fright Night. Welcome back to Jump Scare for our 250th episode. We are celebrating October with Salem's Lot 2024. Woo! I've always written stories about things that are so terrible. You'll run away until your brain won't remember. So why did you come back? I'm here for research. What exactly, though, are you researching? I can see the line back in your satin dress. Have you noticed anything out of the ordinary in the lot recently? Don't confess. Someday There are some folks who had some kind of unusual experiences. stories about this place. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into here. Danny, where are you? And so me. This is not a disease you can catch. You better take care. eventually. Things have gone bad in the lot now. the credits are rolling I noticed that William Sadler's in the movie and I'm very excited because I am a William Sadler fan uh, if you do not know who this person is get to the Google and <laughs> find out so who else is in the film you may well, ask yes who else is in the film Betty OMG just found out guys live right now Lewis Holman who plays Ben Mears, the main character in the film, is Bill Pullman's son. Oh, and you know, I'm watching the movie and the whole movie, I'm like, man, that guy looks kind of familiar. He's just so familiar looking. And it's like, oh yeah, because I'm looking at like 90s, you know, Bill Pullman. Yeah. Like early 90s. How old is that guy anyhow? For any, is it saying? I want to say, well, uh, but, he's 30. He's 30 years old. Okay, damn. Yeah. <laughs> this is the third yep. time we have done Salem's Lot so far. We have the film. The, no, the 79 was a miniseries. 79 miniseries, yes. For right. TV. Okay. The one that was in 2002 or 2004 was also a miniseries for TV. This is the first theatrical. This is not a theatrical. It went straight to Max. Oh, but, so, but it wouldn't have gone to Max, yeah. though. It would have gone theatrical. It would have gone theatrical. It's it, not a mini series, is what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, the first one that's not a mini series. So yay, not a mini series. Maybe next time we could see it. it. You know what it is? Even though for it to be officially a film, it has to be what eighty minutes, right? 
Uh, no, it only has to be 40 minutes to be officially longer than a short film. Really? 40 minutes? Okay. Short films in the Academy Awards are anything 40 minutes or less. So if it comes in at 45 minutes, it's considered a feature. Okay. So this movie, I see, I feel like it goes by really fast. Like, which is probably why it makes it... I feel that way now. It might be because I've seen the miniseries so many times that I know more or less what's going to happen, you know, from yeah. point A to point Z. So that definitely is, you know, it's like, okay, I'm watching this for a multi-time. But I have to say, refreshing. Thank you. Yeah, they did quite a few different things with it. Uh, now, this was written and directed by Gary Doberman, and if that name sounds familiar, if you've seen any horror movie in the last few years, he probably wrote it. Uh, just as examples, he was the guy who wrote the Annabelle movies, and he wrote uh, the screenplays for the It, Chapter 1, Chapter 2, The Nun. He also worked, he developed and created the Swamp Thing TV series that aired a few years ago, which was pretty good. Uh, it was way better than uh, I expected it to be, and it was a shame it got canceled because it was getting better and better as it went on. And then as a director, he also directed what I think is a pretty good one of the Annabelle movies, the uh, Annabelle Comes Home, which we kind of joked and said it's the Annabelle Jumanji thing where a lot of the games and toys in the house come to life. Yeah. Yeah, I liked that one a lot. I thought that was pretty good. So he's done some... Uh, He's done some good things, and he did a good job on this one, I think. He's done a good job at adapting Stephen King, that's for sure. I have to say, um, you know, I'm still stuck on the Lewis Pullman thing. Okay, here we go. He's going to be in the upcoming Thunderbolts movie, and he's going to be Sentry? I mm-hmm. don't know anything about Thunderbolts, but I have to say, I see a rising star. <laughs> <laughs> and... He did a really good... See, now when you watch the trailer, you... Right off the bat, I was like, this is 70s, set in the 70s, right? So, you know, when films now try to set things in the past, a lot of the times they just fail at it. Um, For those that are in the know, if you have no idea, you're like, oh, this is how it was like. And it's like, no. Um, Not that I was alive in the 70s. But the look of it, it, they didn't try too hard. It wasn't like shoved down my throat. It was very subtle. And everything looked really authentic. Yeah, they didn't try to go out of their way to like scream constantly at the 70s. Have people come in and go, what's this crazy Carter administration about? Or whatever, you know. <laughs> that Nixon? Or what, you know, try to do the over the top like some of the places do with things. Where they kind of they constantly make references. Because with a little tweaking, you could have easily set this in modern times. And it wouldn't have been that outrageous you know yeah you could have but the whole the you know what the issue was with modern times so why doesn't he pick up a cell phone why is he not googling what well, yeah, you know that Google shit. what's going on with vampires or exactly whatever. exactly and cell phones you know immediately solve a lot of problems in movies yes now dr cody is played by alfrey woodward so we have you know a lot of recognizable faces um, yeah she's been in a ton of things everything from other horror at the Annabelle movies and that, which is probably where she worked with Gary Doberman before. Yes. And uh, she's been in Star Trek movies. She's been in everything. Um, now, Mark Petrie, which is the uh, the guy who, you know, in the original miniseries, the kid's scratching at the other one's door, window saying, let me in, let me in. Yes. That's Mark Petrie. And th- this time it's played by uh, Jordan Preston Carter. And uh, he's obviously a very young actor. He's been in a few things here and there, like... Uh, Shaft. Shaft and Miss Marvel, and things like that. But obviously, he he can't be more than about twelve, so he's not been in a ton of things yet. But he does a great job in this. He's very uh, believable, and it's, they they change the character a little bit from the books, but not in a bad way. As someone who's read the book a few times, listened to the audio book, read the quasi prequel to this called Jerusalem's Lot, they did a really good job of changing things that you know it doesn't really matter on some of the stuff if they change it like adding alfred woodard's character that character is not in the book there's no doctor that comes and helps them out at any point yeah but they added her in and it doesn't really detract from it because a lot of the stuff in the book was stephen king was teaching our town in his english classes 
and he was literally like taking inspiration from our town with all the characters and the subplots and this person sleeping with this person and then there's a lot in the book with backstories of characters well it's stephen king so by the time it's over you know every character in there you know what underwear they wear, what drinks they like. What Barlow's favorite curtains were. Yeah, you know the all color. the colors. You know all that kind of stuff is in there. The lady's name who dyed the curtains. Yeah. The whole so thing. there was a lot of it that you could have cut out. And that's what they did was they just boiled it down to here's like the about like five main characters. This is how it's affecting them. And didn't worry about trying to explain, oh, the real estate guy is cheating with the woman at the library, and this is going to happen because of this, and this, and this. They cut a lot of that out. It's not, it's interesting in the book because it, obviously they spend more time in the book establishing more characters and more people turning to vampires, but, but you don't necessarily need it. It was all fodder. They need people to kill. Yeah, people need to be killed, and people, yeah. they want to make you care about them a little bit, and then they get killed. Yeah, I do care about the main characters, whether or not they live long enough or not. I did care about them in this version. Yeah. I could care less about them in the other versions, kind of. <laughs> I, I, I'm I, always a sucker for um, the writer, of course, obviously, you know. And, a Stephen um, King book with a writer character in it that's a stand-in for Stephen King? Hush, you say. What? That's never been done. No. Um, <laughs> oh my god um, yeah you just threw me off with that damn you sir uh, I do like this is the this was the first time we had uh, characters moving someone moving to a small town to open an antique store in a Stephen King book but not the last because wow. of course it happens again in needful things it's a great so movie. yeah yeah, there's a lot of things you're going to see. There are little things here and there, but that's what makes... Stephen King is creating a world. But Something else that I did like about this is that they didn't try to connect it to all the other Stephen King things. They didn't have anybody going, hey, I just came in from Derry. Yeah. And all this Wink. kind of stuff. Yeah. They didn't feel the need to do any of that. So this could completely stand on its own without having to be connected to any other Stephen King things. Yeah, there's no tortoises. Yeah. There was... Which, you know, a lot of the stuff in Salem's Lot never really came back until some of the later Dark Tower novels. Is when, you know, in the Dark Tower novels, Father Callahan returns. You see what happened to uh, Ben and Mark years later. They show that in those, in those books. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Well, I didn't say what happened. I just said they show what happens. <laughs> and, uh, it's not a spoiler alert. It's just like the 20th version. Yeah. <laughs> Five... Ten years from now, we're going to be talking about, oh, here's another Salem's Lot. Well, I think that's why it's you can adapt it every few years because, you know, you had one in 79, and then, like, over 20 years later, you have another one, and then 20 years later, you have another one. So Technically, didn't we kind of had a version out there within the last, like, five years? <laughs> Midnight Mass. <laughs> Midnight Mass. Yeah, you can see where Midnight Mass got some ideas from. Oh, some ideas? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Love you, Mike Flanagan. Love you. Hearts, 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 But hearts. we were in the minority of people who did not care for Midnight Mass. No, because I saw Salem's Lot. So, And I love Salem's Lot. I haven't read I'm not a constant reader like somebody over here. But I would like to read it one day. There's... Something about, obviously, the ultimate story. Good versus evil, right? Because, look, the whole movie and all of the miniseries, this this version, I'm sitting here as like, why are you not getting in your car driving away? Goodbye. I could care less about any of these people. None of my family's here. I have no ties. Hot damn, I haven't even, no one even knows my name. I'm just, actually everyone knows his name, but, you know, I'm just out. No one's going to survive anyways to remember my name. Everyone's going to be dead, so there's no harm, no foul. Yeah. You know? But, you know, when you're the good guy, you can't just let this, this is going to follow you. This is not the end. You're not going to just walk away from this and just live a life. No, this freaking thing is a disease. It's going after all the small towns, and it's going to wake its make its way up into the larger towns, and then... It's going to be chaos, you know. But I do feel 
that the next version of Salem's Lot, I want them to do some fucking crazy shit they've never done before. I want them just to like only take some of the things from Stephen King's novel. And I oh. wanted to turn it around and it's Barlow. Don't tell me they fucking have oh, a bar. You mean Castle Rock? Oh, is that what Castle Rock? Remember when they did that whole season of Castle Rock where it was Oh yeah. Uh what's her fucking name? Uh from yeah, Misery. From misery, yes. Yeah, comes to Annie town. Wilkes. Yeah, when Annie Wilkes comes to Salem's Lot and is dealing with all the vampires and the evil things. See, but I liked, okay, well, yes, Castle Rock. I did like Castle Rock ish, um, but we're not, we're putting that aside. No, I wanted to be, but I feel bad for Barlow. What's Barlow's wants and needs? What is, uh, besides blood. blood, besides blood, what's his blood, goal? Fancy antiques. What is his goal? Fancy antiques. <laughs> And it would make sense that a vampire would be selling antiques. I mean, let's be real. The bitch has to travel special, okay? Special accommodations. That costs money. And the further into... I mean, let's say the man's, the, the vampire's been alive for like a thousand years. The taxes and the inflation alone would kill you, okay? He needs to get some kind of money. He's like, look... I lived before there was like, I don't know, anything. So I have some crazy antiques, wink. All the <laughs> antiques that are in that shop is actually his belongings. It's like his f- traveling eBay, okay? But just like a brick and mortar store. That's what those antiques are about. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Boom, Antiques Roadshow, Barlow edition. Make it happen. I put it out there in a fucking universe and I want to see this as a TV show. What what we do in the shadows is ending, and now we must have this version. This is the next vampire show. That would be a good one. Yeah, I would totally fucking watch that. Straker and Barlow's Antiques Roadshow? Yes. Oh, that'd be a great sketch, though. Can you imagine? It would be a great sketch. Someone's going to steal that from us now, so it's it's going to happen. But hey, we get to see it, so that would be cool. See it come to life. Now, the other thing, as I'm sitting there and there's, you know... They're fighting the vampires, and they have these... Let me tell you, those crosses, though? Where'd they get those crosses? Because they were thick. Those were the thickest crosses I've ever seen in any vampire movie I've ever watched my entire life. And let me tell you, I've seen a shit ton of fucking vampire movies. A lot. I'm sure there's a shit ton I haven't seen yet, but I have seen a lot of my share of vampire films. That is the thickest cross. Now, the crosses... Unlike the other versions, they emanated light. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, that's a cool idea. Oh, wait, John Carpenter did it at the end of the fog. like When the demons came and touched the cross. Yes, and it's hot, glowing, you know. It's amazing. I really, really, really like that. Now they can do that because, of course, back then, they didn't have, there wasn't CGI. And then in the mid two thousands, I mean, there still wasn't that CGI yeah. was terrible, so they weren't going to do that. Um, but I did like how this one, when they would show like the cross touch people, it would burn them. Yes. Well, or, like or, or, it's supposed to, you know, to. repel them. Yes. With the scenes where he was like being forced back, like it was wind pushing him backwards. We're back in the old, like the traditional vampire like lore, not like sparkly fuckers or. You know, yeah. things, you know, day walkers slash I can eat a fucking garlic like an apple, like that shit. Like, we're back to, like, the roots of it. And I did also appreciate um, that because it's different when, I mean, obviously, Stephen King, hello, imagination galore, right? You can write it and it's like, great, that's fucking amazing. But to see it come to life, like, and he liked this version, didn't he? Wasn't he yeah. supporting this version? Yeah, he said this one was good. Yeah, which, hello, that's a big, you know... Yeah, because he's not shy about saying when it's bad. Yeah, pat on the back from Stephen King, you know? Especially because it's, it's like... It's like he said, if the if the movie's good, that's great, it sells more books. Is the movie's bad? That's great, it sells more books. <laughs> Because people buy the right. <laughs> people buy the book to say oh, the book was better, and they go read it. So either way, I win. <laughs> yeah, getting through. I don't. I don't know. I'm very uh, after the Shining. I had to take a little break, which we've mentioned before in a previous episode, I'm sure. But did you have a favorite moment besides 
Um, in this one, there was a few, uh, the very beginning, which we won't spoil, but there's a kill at the very, not really a kill, but an attack at the very beginning that's filmed very well. Oh, yes. Where, you know, you're just watching people go about their day, and then you suddenly realize someone's creeping up behind them. Yeah. That was a great shot. That was a great shot. There's a lot of good shots and a lot of great transitions in this film, yeah. which you don't really see used like that. Yeah, the transitions were great. There's a particular one where they're like, <clears throat> they say, go get the ladder. And then the next scene, you're looking at the ladder, and then it just kind of turns and realizes, oh, they've already put the ladder down and crawled down the ladder and all that. But it was just, the way they did it was very, it was very creative and very, you know, you didn't have to wait for them to go get the ladder. You just kind of saw it there and like, yeah. oh, okay, now they're downstairs. I get it. Yeah. They are very, very neat, uh, <clears throat> moment in the film that you don't see in the other they don't yeah but in any other had like you said there's more going on there's more characters because you know if you have a vampire come to a town the town's already small so if you have like a hundred people in the town here's a vampire he hungry he coming in first night i mean how long was the travel though because i know like i eat probably like every three hours like i'm hungry he's traveling it could be, I don't even days before he eats. I would be famished. So the first night, I would have to eat at least seven people. Like, I'm real thirsty. Well, that's why in the in the book and in the original series, he had them, when they were transporting the box over, he told them, "There's when you get the box down to the basement, wrap these chains around it and put these padlocks on it to keep it closed because he didn't want him busting out and eating half the town that night. That's why he went and got someone from the woods and brought him in to him and just to feed him to him. But, of course, in the miniseries and the book, the idiots just dumped the coffin down in the ba- the crate down in the basement and then ran. Because <clears throat> that was one of the things I always thought was cool in the originals when they were driving. And they were like, why is it so cold in here? Why do you have the air conditioner on? And he's like, I don't. Like, they didn't really know this. Like, the cold was coming out of the crate. Yeah. And that. And, uh... This one, they didn't really get onto that too much, but they did get onto the fact that it was just creepy and they wanted rid of it, you know. Um, I also liked in this that, much like the original, they didn't really show the vampire that much. No, there was a lot of shadow play. Like, just a lot of shadows, like quick glimpses, like a light flicks on and he's there, the light flicks off. Yes. And I like that because then that makes it a little more terrifying. Yeah. If he's not just, you know, prancing around, like you said, sparkling and everything and just making long speeches about everything. And that that's kind of what, I, you know, I think he wanted to get away, Stephen King wanted to get away from too because vampires had become just... You know, this came book came out in 1975. So, you know, this was primarily the time when most of the vampires you saw on screen were either Christopher Lee, mm-hmm. Peter Cushing. It was like, you know, it was those two guys were most of the vampires you saw. They were humanistic in their looks. So yeah. it was like, okay. And then they were charming. It's like the vampire is not this like charming slash sexy or slash like, you know, charismatic blah 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 person you know yeah, this, looking person this is a fucking creature of the night and it's a creature like it's been living on like blood you know it's it's yeah, morphed one, into something else it's no longer human the human is gone yeah, if there one, ever existed he had mr straker that was doing his yeah. you know daylight work for him and of all course, that Of course, you gotta have the that's the um, that's why I love Fright Night because Fright Night is so it's modern but yet traditional. Yeah. In in a lot of senses, and um, we can start talking about Fright Night now. <laughs> but that's why you know that's what I like about the original and this too. The vampire is not like a human thing. He's more like an animal. You know, he he can talk. He says a few things here and there. Mm. In the original series, he really didn't say anything that I recall. But in the book and in this, he. Didn't have a lot to say, but when he did, it was kind of important. You well, know? besides the whole like kitchen scene, yeah, that's the only time I remember her talking. Yeah, and it's just I, I like that approach better. You know, it's more like the vampires, the shark in the movie. You don't see it until it's the closer to the end of the movie. It's a little bit more tension building. You know, um, I don't know how I feel about the makeup or CGI or I. I I don't know. I thought the makeup was good. I know they did one thing where it was like the 
veins were a little bit. Maybe that was CGI. Yeah, it was very veiny. I, I don't know. I, it was just that one scene. I think that was when he was drinking blood in that scene. They did that. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah, he was activated. So his veins were, because that's what's keeping him alive, right? So that's when he's going to yeah. be pale every other, you know, moment. But when he's drinking the blood, he gets a little bit of life in him. So maybe that's what got the veins so, like, bulging out of his head. But yeah, I, I didn't mind that. That was, in terms of CGI in this, that was really the only thing I kind of noticed. The rest of it was pretty good. I think it was just how his face was. His face didn't look... I would be very surprised if there was nothing done to like the actual like face part. Because it just didn't look good. I don't know. It just looked weird. But then, this was a movie that was that was in a trash can. So, it's like... They may not have gotten money to finish all the stuff like they needed to. Exactly. And it's not that it just takes... It doesn't take away from the movie from me. It's just like what you said. You... The whole thing is like... You're not going to show the whole monster the whole time. Or even, you know, from 40 minutes into the movie, you're constantly showing him. Because then there's nothing to fear. You've already seen him. So... But when you're doing all the shadow play and like all of that stuff and then you see him, it's like, oh shit, you know, you have an oh shit moment because you're getting a glimpse of it and it's not a full frontal. Once they finally revealed his face, I was kind of disappointed. Um, even when they, there's a glimpse, I was like, ah, I wish it looked better. But I, but it's so hard. The only thing that is going to make me like bite my words is soon... When the movie that I've been waiting for for years to come out, Nosferatu comes out, and we see uh, Bill in the makeup, I'm like, is he going to be practical? Is there going to be... He, he has such a strong face, but then again, is it gonna, he's going to look like all his other characters? I don't know. But if they're able to execute that, because I don't know how you do that makeup now, you know, because it is just white face, you know, with pointed ears. So it's nothing I've never seen. So it's not scary anymore because I'm kind of like desensitized to it is basically what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, it didn't ruin the movie for me. I just, I wanted a little bit more. Mm. That's all. I guess I'm greedy. I'm greedy like that. I don't know. I want, I want something more ghoulish looking like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> the only thing on this that uh, that I was kept waiting for it to pay off and it, it didn't was the scene at the beginning where... Uh, uh, Mark is uh, being picked on by the bully and you know he takes care of the bully and then I kept waiting for that to come back like oh yeah it never came back I kept waiting for something to come back with that it's not like it's bad because it, it kind of resolved itself there but I kept waiting for there to be something to happen like the bully was going to try and attack him yeah and then the vampire was going to get him or something like that but it didn't it's not that it's bad, but I just kind of thought, okay, maybe they're going to come back. I was waiting for to see that kind of asshole kid get his comeuppance, you know? Yeah. I and mean, he kind of got taken care of a little bit at the time, but I thought something... You know, it's a Stephen King thing, so I was expecting way worse things to happen to him. <laughs> well, the kid himself did a pretty good job. Um, you know, the Mark, he is a little badass. Yeah. You know? And it's like, oh, it's Stephen King, it's kids... They're badasses because usually in Stephen King novels, the kids are like the smart ones or the ones yeah. that know what's going on, whatever, because of the innocent of the kids and like no one ever believes a fucking kid, you know? Well, and like in the, in the book and all the other things, you know, the, the Mark was obsessed with all the monsters, vampires. He was making all those, uh, I can't remember the company that makes them now, but throughout the 60s and 70s, all, every monster kid was obsessed with these model kids. Because you would get together and they were like you, they were like snap together models or glue models that you put together and then painted of the Wolfman, Frankenstein, the Mummy, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he was always putting those together and he had all the posters on the wall. The, yeah. All this kind of stuff. So yeah, that was a good... He's going to be the kid that survives. Yeah. You know, the weirdo, quote unquote, in the small town is like, yeah, I'm walking out of here and all you bitches are going to die. <laughs> But yeah, in terms of everything, um, I thought this was a pretty good adaptation of the book. They just kind of cut out a lot of, I'm not going to say unnecessary characters, but just pared down some of the characters. They trimmed the fat. Yeah. And, you know, you got what was going on. And I do like movies and TV shows and things where 
when people are, you know, they say, oh, vampires are coming, and people are like, yeah, I don't know. And then they see the first thing and go, yep, you're definitely right. I hate it when they pull the scully and are like, yeah, I know we just saw the alien ship land and aliens get out and dance around for five minutes, but I still don't believe in the aliens, Mulder. Where's the proof? Yeah, and it's like, um, what? Yeah, we just saw that. So I like it when they just immediately kind of like, okay, we saw it, we know it's true, let's move on with our life. I give this two and a half knives. <laughs> I'm making that face at you. This is a this is a clearly a three and a half knife adaptation of this. Wow, three okay, of this. We're going by based on the other ones. No, no, not I'm just, just saying, the movie as a whole. No, I'm just saying there's a three and a half star adaptation. I, I like it. Yeah. I it's not see, I don't know. I'm gonna have to revisit my own personal ratings because it's hard to rate what I rate like three plus and I don't know. I take away points for some things. Am I, maybe I'm taking away too many points about the whole Barlow look. Um, I'm going to say three knives, but you're not going to get another knife out of me. All right. Three knives. It does deserve the three knives. It's just... The effects are generally pretty decent. I like the setting of it. Um, I'm not going to spoil what it is, but the uh, the climax of it had a very interesting setting that I haven't seen done before. There was um, some character development, enough character yeah. development. Enough that it kept everything moving. And I cared for the people. Yeah, the acting's all great. Yeah, the acting was fantastic. Everyone did a great job. So, yeah, that's why I don't really have any major issues with it. Fine. Three Knives makeup doesn't get the half of the knife. It's not a, it's not <laughs> Fine. There. For me, you you stay at the three and a half. I'll stay at three. You know, All right, we're there fine. you go. Thank you so much for joining us on our two hundred and fiftieth episode Woo-hoo! of Jump Scare the Horror Podcast. Stay tuned to the horror. And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.